A very good afternoon and welcome back to day one of the Digital Money 2020 organized by Payments Council of India. I would quickly like to take the opportunity to thank all our partners, our title partner LIDA, our powered by partner PhonePay, our agenda partner Pay PayPoint, our payments partner PayU, our gold partners Visa, Freshworks, AWS, our silver partners Zeta and Paytm, our knowledge partner PwC and our design partner Ethos. Wow. So without further ado, we would like to commence with our next session. Our next session is a panel discussion on the topic regulating the payment gateways and aggreg aggregators, a move to freeing the industry or restricting its growth. And for the same, I would like to welcome first our moderator, Mr. Amit Jain, Director, Tax and Regulatory Practice, PwC India. We welcome you, Mr. Jain. Thank you. Hi. And our esteemed panelists, Mr. Devang Nirala, CEO, Atom Technologies. Mr. Akash Gehani, co-founder and COO Instamojo, Mr. Tushar Shankar, co-founder e-commerce, and Mr. Ravi Gupta, founder SafeXPay. We welcome Hi. all our panelists. Hi. And I would Thank now request much. Mr. Amit. Thank you. Mr. Amit to please take over the session. Thank you. Thank you, Gaima. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, good afternoon. Hope everyone is keeping safe and healthy. Yeah. Wel welcoming again to all the audience and my panel, panelist member to this interesting session on payment aggregator and gateway guidelines. As a quick context, uh, way back in 2009, RBI issued a circular indirectly supervising these set of players to the nodal account framework. Since then, for the first time, RBI issued the comprehensive set of guidelines asking these set of players more into payment aggregation business to come and apply for the license and for payment gateway companies which do not handle customer funds to adopt a baseline technology standards recommended by RBI. So we have these set of guidelines from merchant onboarding to settlements to handling of customer grievances, including data security requirements. Unlike in some other countries, such as Singapore, Malaysia, and EU nations, where the central banks and financial re sector regulators have adopted a risk-based approach in regulating or supervising some of these payment products and entities. In India, the Reserve Bank of India has preferred a full-fledged approach to regulate payment aggregator companies in the interest and to protect customer funds and data. So that's where we stand today, where we are before the guidelines. And we have a universe of players in payment aggregation business who are looking to see how the impact of these guidelines will come in as and when they start implementing that. So with this backdrop in mind, let me now turn to my panelists and let me start with Akash. Akash, you, I just thought maybe as a, as a good starting point, it would be good if you share some perspective about this industry as a whole, the, evolu the evolution of this industry and how you guys have come and have the merchants come on board adopting digital means and digital payments as a channel. So Akash. Right. Thanks, Amit. So yeah, it's, it's been very, very fascinating, right? Uh, I remember I had first uh, made an online payment back in 2002 or something. Uh, I bought a ticket on IRCTC and I was just amazed. I'm like, oh, this works. I don't have to go and queue up at the, at the station and this ticket just did an e-ticket. It was basically we had to just make a transaction and a couple of days later, the, the post came to my home. And I was so thrilled, right? And I'm like, okay, this is the future of sorts, right? This is the way commerce could happen. And I think since then, We've come a long way. I remember we started, right? We started Insta Mojo back in 2012. So it's been more than eight years now. And, uh, and the driving point for us was, can we help every small business come online and adopt the internet for, for their business, right? Because till then, there were, there were payment companies out there, but they were essentially catering to the bigger companies, to the big enterprises, right? Like IRCTZs and many others. But there was no room for any small business to come. And you know, use that. And that's why we thought, can we can we do this? Can we make a simple platform for for these companies? And of course, there's a lot of challenges we faced. 
right from you know trying to sell this idea to the banks to understand what kind of risk is there how do the regulations work and yes that has been you know simplified to a good extent since then but i remember in the early days till you know from 2012 to 2013 14 like the first two to three years every time i spoke to a merchant the common uh, thread through those conversations was they were very happy with cash so like you know what yeah my customer pays me in cash and this is good like i don't i don't have any challenge with it and it was difficult to sell the idea that your customers can be anywhere they can make a payment to you, to you online and you save a lot of your time effort maybe some cost also with this and it's just so much more convenient and they never could you know understand that at that point but yes things did change thanks in a large part to all the great e-commerce companies that we have thanks to you know the uh, you know wallets getting popular after that and of course in uk came so i think multiple things have happened in the last 6 uh, to 8 years and of course even before that a lot of things there happened so to give you a sense in in this year in our short journey itself we have onboarded about 1.4 million merchants on insta mojo to collect online payments and this is just one, us as you know as one of the participants in the at a broader segment there is so much more which has happened there are so many millions of merchants which have come on board collecting payments in various ways it could be cards it could be upi the upi which in itself has been nothing short of spectacular right in, in just about 4 or 8 years since it's launched today about 30% of all our transactions are powered by upi right or basically use upi the upi is a mode of payment so that that has been like you know fascinating <laughs> so the way some of these things have grown and i think just maybe to complete my point uh, some of the things that we have seen in the kind of merchants that we've seen coming on like so through this journey right what what we've seen is a lot of new use cases which we never thought were possible we've seen individual tutors coming online and selling content content where their students can uh, you know download uh, essentially pay them for ias coaching and many other kinds of exam material and you know prepare for those exams or we've seen so many cottage industries across the country like house sports in kerala so many other cases in many of these cases these are businesses which we never thought were possible right or which actually existed out there so it's it's been fascinating and today we seeing this whole new set of businesses a lot of these entrepreneurs or we call them solopreneurs of sort sitting out of their home and running a business right your your neighbor who's making chocolates or you know some other things at home and trying to sell that in a small community across a neighborhood so a lot of these businesses are coming online and what all of them essentially are relying on is the power of the internet and of course when you do that online payments or basically payments powering that is essentially the key infrastructure which all of them need so i think they're in for much more exciting times and yeah it's been it's been a fascinating journey sure thank thanks akash for sharing this perspective uh coming back to the guidelines uh, let me uh, let me come to devan uh, uh what's your initial uh, quick reaction on positives uh, that you see uh, from from these newer guidelines and maybe one or two constraints uh, that you foresee on implementation uh, of the conditions uh, uh, as, as you move forward yeah thanks a lot uh, excuse my voice uh, i have been having a sore throat since last three or four days it's non covid don't worry about that it's quite perfectly fine that you can be giving a disclaimer <clears throat> if you look at the guidelines per se itself are very positive in nature because when you talk about rbi coming in issuing a guideline and regulating the payment industry see earlier normally when a person looks at it any industry you look at basically you talk about regulations are bad generally we feel but given that pay- payments is a very very sensitive area and today for example we talk about uh, there are payment gateway providers who are mushrooming at the pace of at least four or five payment gateway providers per state so i'm not i will not be basically saying that it could be lesser than that but definitely there'll be more than that and that definitely poses a risk to the entire system per se number one basic risk is not only factor authentication and other things but there are a lot of merchants who are getting into international merchants plus there are people who are getting into uh, uh, let's say merchant frauds there are Large amount of merchant frauds that that could occur out there. That systemic risk, and it's a good thing that RBI selects. First of all, I would say that. Second, and if you look at from the guidelines per se, of course, the, with the guidelines they put in an entry barrier with the number of capitals because 
that capital about 15 crores and then subsequently going down at 5 crores i think that's an adequate kind of a capital they put it in line in sync with what was there for ppis and uh, that creates a sort of an entry barrier you would not have person coming into the ecosystem how to start people from becoming a payment gateway so they're saying payment aggregators or second handing funds they need to necessarily have certain amount of basically uh, kind of uh, capitalization so that basically the companies don't go flat out there so that is one positive i would say second basically some of the key things i would say is basically of course the t plus delta kind of a thing you had that uh, t plus p r s and basically when rbi spoke about i think there's a first time if you look at the old 2009 guidelines they are not mentioned about basically all those things they are only mentioned that quite t plus 3 you need to settle the money now banks and nodal banks are going and working on that principle the business doesn't work on that principle today for example if you need to take care of merchant uh, retail merchant you want to ensure that basically money is given to customer if there is a charge back any kind of response you can control against that so this is basically some things say basically initial views in terms of positives out there so uh, aside from that of course uh, we spoke about it was kind of a thing uh, basically the overall guidelines per se the no guidelines is possible on the side uh, yes there are certain amount of constraints uh thankfully rbi has received we removed some of the constraints earlier basically they have put in the constraint of uh, following the entire uh, kyc aml kind of guidelines which i think given the clarifications of we had kind of diluted that kind of provisions because if essentially we are and people were I mean, that's one of the viewpoints from payment council i have uh, been a part of the payment council executive council as well as i'm a chairman of the merchant aggregators committee so the whole essence out for us was basically uh, merchants who are there i have i have legitimate bank accounts where the money needs to be transferred so Uh, issues still pending right now. I would say uh, that can be resolved to dialogue. Uh, of course, I mean, I mean, one of them is basically we've spoken about uh, cloning of data. So, yeah, basically, in terms of how you look at the user experience, we've we've already given a representation and all. So, in such cases, basically, what happens is uh, you talk about recurring uh, payments. You're talking about a whole lot of two checkout and faster checkout kind of an experience. I think those sort of experience you kind of miss out when you look at the storage of data issues out there. second is basically enforcing and trying to ensure that we the, so the payment aggregator i don't think see we are not uh, regulators we are not police men out there and at the same time when you look at the merchant side the whole the merchant ecosystem has developed because they are not pci dss yes we are all on for card data security and uh, customer security customer uh, protection of data but at the same time all since the data is going to reside on a payment aggregator page itself when you look at online payment specifically so it's going to reside on online on a payment aggregator page then it becomes easier for for example uh, to rely on the data which is going because the data is not stored anywhere else only thing is what we can do is basically ensure and ask the merchant for compliance if they are following the compliance or not but asking the merchant every merchant in the country to be pci dss compliant is going to kill the entire industry per se because in that sense what happens is you have as i was i think akash was mentioning 1.65 million there are going to be at least about 5 to 10 million merchants which are going to be online we are not talking about offline merchants but at least 5 to 10 million merchants are online most of the merchants 99.5% of the merchants are going to be killed you have to go to take them off the basically electronic payment life cycle and that is where the constraints are going to come in. so this is basically some of the issues which i would talk about i think i'm sure i would others would have definitely different view point but yes these are things which would basically constrain uh, or we are hopeful that rbi will take cognizance of this and uh, at least give some sort of a leeway there sure thanks thanks devang uh, in fact you made a couple of interesting points and i'm going to come up uh, uh, and have on this data security piece Uh, but before that, let me uh, turn to uh, Ravi. Uh, uh, Ravi, uh, maybe your also quick reaction, positives, and uh, some constraints that you foresee uh, as far as the guidance. And alongside, if you could also throw some light on how do you see some of these small players uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, evolve? Uh, are they going to exit? Are they going to sort of uh, stay in the in the ecosystem? So maybe uh, uh, your perspective around that is also going to be useful. Sure. Thanks, Amit. <laughs> so basically uh, if you talk about rbi move for uh, for this uh, the pa guidelines i think it's a pretty uh, pretty positive for the overall industry right 
and people wants to uh, people wants to accompany those guidelines in terms of whether you talk about data privacy or security or a pc dss guidelines or you talk about the transaction level security the cust- the most important problem which customer faces their transaction status right what happened to their particular transaction status whether it's uh, been handled properly or not so these are the things which rbi is trying to regulate which is a pretty uh, positive move across the industry right coming on to the small uh, players uh, right uh, which is of course there are the guidelines of net worth uh, which is i think is going to kill most of the small payments player because earlier we talked about the payment is all about in 2009 uh, right it was more like a nodal guidelines where you have to set up a nodal and of course the money is in control with the nodal bank as a pa we are not authorized to access that amount right we can just inspect the nodal banks and they can settle it to the respective merchants but but coming on to this uh, guide, this new guidelines which is going to kill more in terms of the smaller uh, smaller more, smaller payment gateways there just like devang sir said right there are four to five companies coming on every month or yearly basis into different different states right so i think these kinds of uh, companies will not uh, come much into the picture because if you have to obey the rbi guidelines of uh, this uh, so this net worth of 15 crores by 2020 uh, sorry 2021 and by 23 you need to have a 20, uh, 25 crores of uh, net worth so i think most of the players will get killed right in terms of uh, uh, these small players but of course uh, there is a lots of innovations and uh, which the industry will try to bring into the picture because there are certain constraint like uh, if we have certain compliances which is, which are needs to be done then it's come at a cost right so every pa has to go through a lots of uh, putting up a team in terms of uh, nodal officer customer grievances the technology level setup the privacy level setup the infrastructure level setup so what would be the cost so as a pa uh, we have to basically uh, find out the more avenues how you can re innovate the overall product offerings so maybe like uh, i can move uh, uh, maybe that's all my view right sure thanks thanks uh, ravi uh, uh, tushar uh, Uh, your uh, thoughts, uh, reaction on the guidance, uh, and more importantly, I wanted uh, you to maybe share some perspective around uh, product innovations, user experiences. How do you see the life post the implementation of these guidelines? Will the life be as usual, or do you see is going to impact some of the innovations which you have been doing in the past? Oh, thanks, Amit. <laughs> see the. Uh... see for any any anything to be successful there needs to be a unified model and that's basically what rbi has tried to do there were a lot of payment aggregators in the market which was largely an organized sector what rbi has done it has laid the infrastructure for a seamless payment that needs to happen that's the code of conduct that anybody who wants to do payments needs to follow this so you yes you have a clear view that rbi has set by putting in these guidelines it's going to get two things one is it is going to accelerate the digital transactions in the country number one because it's a unified infrastructure that comes in second and more importantly it is going to get the fence sitters who are not transacting digitally come on the transact uh, digital transactions why do i say so because largely people we we all have faced this problems that my account has been debited but it has not reached the merchant so where do i go or do i go to my bank do i go to the merchant rbi has set a very clear guideline this is how you will dispute or this is where you will reach out to the person so there is a responsible person who will and then there are guidelines that in how much time the money should go back and all so that's going to increase the faith of the general population in transacting digitally in the country as far as innovations yes it will be a tough time for companies that do not reach that kind of a, a net worth requirement and an ongoing net worth requirement but innovations are not going to stop there are ways so uh, i mean you can always partner up with certain uh, pas or you may provide your technology to banks where and and these are the uh, I, these are the agencies who will test your product not only from a scale point of view because they will get you the scale but they will also test your products from the rbi guideline the kyc the aml uh, the security point of view and what will come out in the market will largely be a tested and proven product which comes out in the market so definitely there will be innovations i see more of the uh, technology providers or the people who are innovating tying up with pas tying up with banks to get that tech- technology to be used outside uh, by the general public 
Got it. Thank, thanks, Tushar. Uh, very interesting. Um, uh, Akash, I just want to bring you in. Uh, uh, so this payment aggregation business or acquiring business is already running on a wafer thin margins. Uh, there are <laughs> regulatory caps. Uh, the business is also getting more and more competitive and it's hitting your margins. Uh, now with that already, uh, we have a newer set of regulations uh, with a lot of obligations, compliances, reportings, and you need to have a good sort of a governance standards and mechanism in the business and, 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 the, and the entity uh, and have a right set of teams of uh, uh, putting in place. Uh, how do you see uh, the, the cost of compliance and the, the, the business margin, which are already there, uh, getting sort of more and more impacted, balancing between the two? So it definitely has been, uh, you know, becoming more and more difficult. And I think just, just before I come to this, right, on the earlier point, which was about the network, right? So I think uh, Devang, Ravi, everyone added their points, and which of course, Quaker, there's a lot of merit there. I think the only concern that I have to add there is it does restrict a lot of uh, new companies from coming in. And I like had these regulations existed eight years back, we would never have been able to start a company and forget yeah. about bringing the next set of million merchants online. So I think that's something that has to be looked at. So the other thing regarding this is that the cost of compliance has been going up. Uh, and of course, right, there is a lot of money laundering which happens. So it is justified. There are certain things which you have to do. But one thing that we have to, or what we you know, understand is everything that a payment aggregator is doing, what any other payment company is doing, it's essentially building on top of what the banks already have. So there is a certain set, uh, let's see what KYC, which the bank has done. There is there is an escrow account, which every company again has to comply with, which is also technically owned by the bank, right? So there is a lot of things that anyway is very much under control. So adding another set of restrictions on top of this may not really help. I think it's it might take away it from actually do, uh, bringing in more protection it might go the go a lot further and just stifle a lot of innovation, which can actually happen. What we have seen is over the last couple of years or last year or so, is that see for, for a new company, for a small company, working with banks is always going to be a challenge right? because banks work at their own pace. There's a lot of structure and bureaucracy that you have to go through. So it's, it's never easy, but it's just got a little more difficult also over the years. And I've heard this guy for many companies. And one of the reasons is because banks don't see this as a profit center. Banks don't see a lot of money to be made over here. What that means is they are also a little more hesitant in investing into the space or essentially providing the companies any kind of tools that they need. So it is it is a difficult, or I wouldn't say difficult, it's a very competitive scenario with, and as you said, right, wafer thin margins, with more competition, with certain regulations around pricing as well. It only takes you know a hit for the worse. So some of these regulations do go a step further and instead of regulating the industry, it actually goes a step further and, you know, tries to stifle the innovation of it. I understand. Thanks. Thanks, Akash. Uh, a very, very different perspective uh, you, br you brought in in terms of uh, uh, overall sort of outlook of these regulations. Devan, I just want to get you in. Uh, 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 since uh, this guidelines through 2009 have been in existence since last uh, 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 decade, and a lot of companies like yours have already been adhering to some of these practices mandated by card schemes, your acquirer banks, and others. Of course, with a different sort of a different approach. Uh, how do you see the preparedness of all of these uh, the companies uh, once we kind of have this newer set of guidelines coming in? Do you think uh, you are already there and there's going to be more a lot more uniformity coming in, practices coming in to kind of take the, the sort of pairs and the transactions to a different level? How do you see that space? Because a lot of things no. are already put in practice by the companies. Yeah, for a lot of things were in practice because one of the things I tell you, at, even at PCI level, we are debated about the nodal bank and why do we need to go in for, guide, for guidelines and other things. <clears throat> But when we look at the overall thing, yes, there is certain merit in terms of when our regulator thinks about certain things for protection of the entire industry per se, and rather than having new ways mushrooming in. Uh, when you look at fundamental changes, because what changes right now for everybody is compliance. Because when you are under a regulatory ambit, what differentiates, let's say, for example, we had been a prepaid instrument issuer earlier. We had surrendered a license because of the whatever reasons. But when we were there, we had seen the kind of regulatory oversight on top of basically whatever functions we are doing. 
So moment you become a regulated entity versus you are a non-regulated entity. As a non-regulated entity, it's like you're staying in a hostel, right? You're you're studying in a college, you're staying in a hostel, you're enjoying your life. You don't have anybody. You just have a warden to talk about. Your warden was a noodle bank account. That's it. When you are at home at that point of time, you have a kind of a control barrier out there. There are going to be basically certain amount of checks and balances. There are going to be certain check, things about compliance which are going to be far more stringent. If you, earlier, for example, you could get away with a certain things, a certain leeway out there. Now it becomes kind of very very difficult in terms of how you could escape that sort of thing because then you are in scrutiny out there. In a way, it has it's kind of a double edged sword out there. It could be beneficial. It could be negative also. For good yeah. players, I don't think it's going to be bad. It's going to be good for them anyway. They've been doing, they've been following the guideline, they've been doing everything across. Things are going to go as as the way they have been. On the other side, basically, whether when you look at pricing or anything, I don't think those things are changing. But those are larger discussions which the government of India is having, and basically, government is dictating the pricing and everything else. I don't think the pricing is being dictated by RBI. It's only the regulatory side of the whole thing. It's only compliance level changes. So compliance in both the sides. One. Is IT compliance because if you look at the overall, look at the annexures out there in terms of the IT compliance they're talking about. We're not even talking about uh, the protection of data or customer protection of or data storage in India and all those things, but a whole lot of guidelines over and about that. The system audit report and whole lot of other things and the reports that you need to give. Those sort of things are going to grow. Plus, basically, yes, uh, the, there are certain things which have got incrementally added over the last few years. If you look at, there have been guidelines which have been issued by RBI for ensuring that people who have like uh, for failed transactions. Uh, they have got guidelines about a year back where they spoke about five days. You need to re- uh, refund the money back to the customer, else you have a penalty. So these things have been in place. So these are just been put as I think Tushar was perfectly put it. They put into a box. They structured it rather than being loosely coupled kind of. Then I think we are going to go forward on that. So my sense is changes, of course, in terms of fundamental changes in terms of compliance. But other than that, I don't think it's going to be it's going to be business as usual per se. I don't not seeing too many drastic changes coming in the way people are going to do business out there. Understood. Thank, thanks, Devan. Thanks, Devan. Tushar, uh, uh, I just want to uh, touch upon this uh, uh, data security piece, uh, which uh, Devan just alluded to, uh, uh, more around uh, the, the storage of credit card card credentials, storage of payments data, customer data uh, in the databases of payment aggregators and the merchants. Uh, uh, RBI would like these uh, payers not to store these data for security and other reasons. How do you see that's going to impact the user experience going forward? Uh, or do you see that mm-hmm. there's a merit for RBI to go back and revisit this condition? See, how I see look how at I it is it. two ways. One is that there will be a set of compliance that we already were, whether it was PCI DSS and some of us also did. For example, we had Ficom also went ahead and did a PA DSS of our product. So as far as data security was concerned, so any any aggregator today handles two kinds of data. One is the transactional data, which is his card number and transaction, and the other is personal data about him. Right now, we have the guidelines by RBI on how to control the transactional data, but we soon will be getting from the government India about guidelines for personal data storage. Now, when it comes to card storage, yes, it was a very, very efficient tool where it was a quick checkout for people because card number were already stored and which maybe there is a restriction which is going to come by RBI. But now we must remember that at the same time now, transactions are not only card based. It tokenization is coming in. You have UPI handles which are coming in. So slowly and steadily, uh, cards will be only a way of uh, pointing to an account, but it will have a lot, lot many aliases. First of which is the UPI handle. Then you will have the tokenization which has already started coming in now. So, yes, there may be a slight glitch initially till the time the whole tokenization thing sets in place. But with the people used to using VPA handles, tokenization will be an easier challenge. And that would again get it back and the transaction would again be seamless. Because that's all, that's what we all every time say that all the technology is the wires under the table. What you have on top is just is just a very plain and simple Valina experience. And that's what all of these things will enable for consumers to transact even more seamlessly than before. Got it, got it. Thanks, thanks, Sushar. Uh, Ravi, uh, uh, so uh, these guidelines at times are seen to be prescriptive enough uh, uh, when it comes to, let's say, settlement timelines uh, in terms of uh, shipment of products. <laughs> Uh, delivery confirmations, refunds uh, to be settled within uh, some timelines. 
uh, in comparison, there was a flexibility available prior to these prescriptive uh, timelines, uh, and that was more governed by the con bilateral contracts between the merchants and the aggregators. How do you see that? Is that the step in the right direction to bring more uniformity uh, uh, across the payers and the and the system? Uh, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, Amit, uh, I just tell you, so just like earlier, we had our nodal guidelines, right? So of course, it's running right now also. But coming onto the escrow, it brings going to bring more visibility across the ecosystem, right? Because just like nodal guidelines generally says T plus three, what is T? No one knows, right? So it is some people treat it as a transaction date or some people treat more as a delivery date, correct? So right now, if you see the current RBA guidance on escrow, right, it brings more transparencies, right? So where RB has said that uh, the escrow uh, settlement from the respective banks can uh, banks can happen on T0 or T1, depending on the different mo business model of the merchant, whether it could be a real-time services, it could be an offline delivery base where they're using the link-based payments, right? So depending on the delivery, you can have next day payments. So it's bringing more transparency across the overall ecosystem and where the merchant also knows the visibility when I'm going to go get the uh, get the settlement, right? Earlier, uh, the, it's already the control into the aggregator level where uh, basically they can define the T depending on the business model, but now it's, it can be controllable with the new guidance. That's the best part here. Got it. Got it. Sure. Thank, thanks, Ravi. Uh, they want just uh, uh, another thought, uh, maybe a perspective I wanted to begin, and this is more around the merchant frauds. Uh, uh like we there are enough uh, uh, practices being adopted by all of you in in your individual pockets uh, and now uh, sort of all of the companies now getting regulated and coming to a more sort of a formal uh, regulated ecosystem how do you see uh, the space getting more uh, sort of a washed out in the context of getting a more centralized uh, merchants fraud ecosystem like some 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 I, I, in the morning even i was hearing uh, uh, mr vasudevan was making some con some point around creating a centralized fraud uh, ecosystem or, or the or the system i think that's where uh, you guys are going to be much more relevant and important to share some of your some of the practices some of the incidents notifications which is going to help uh, sort of a lot of lot more other players are going to come uh, and join this on join this ecosystem yeah, I agree. I think what happens in this case is, think after the, uh, the two-factor authentication, as I said, customer fraud has kind of gone off the system right now. Other channels and other things, for example, UPI and other modes, we've seen different kind of things emanating. Those will keep on coming up and those will get addressed over a period of time. <clears throat> the larger thing is basically the merchant fraud. And this is one of a couple of things. One, basically, RBI's initiative of creating a centralized uh, storage or centralized database of merchant fraud was definitely welcome. This is some of the things we are trying to do at even again at PCI, where we spoke about basically creating a centralized database where our individual, the, because today the entire payment industry is represented by PCI. When you look at Payment Council, represents, so the idea was to basically collect the data voluntarily from basically all the merchants. For example, if there's a merchant which Atom has, which has done a fraud on Atom, we would have to necessarily report it to a centralized fraud bureau or whether in a, a owned by PCI or same thing could be at RBI also. And same thing, I think, is reciprocative could be with basically uh, Ravi or Cephex or maybe Instamojo or Fi or anybody else who are basically having fraud merchants. Let them report it so that tomorrow, if there is any kind of merchant fraud occurring or any kind of chance of any fraud occurring, you're minimizing that fraud. So idea is to minimize the fraud. I don't think you can eliminate fraud 100%. There are going to be new ways of coming out there, but that will definitely help. A centralized storage will definitely help. It's like uh, when you look at, I don't know if you understand the Visa and Master, they have a database called InMass and Match. So this would become that kind of uh, overall centralized storage wherein every player in the country, when they're boarding a merchant, they, they can do their checks and balances before boarding the merchant, whether a merchant is a fraud or not a fraud out there. And then they can take their own decisive calls. See, ultimately, it's whether to do it or not do it. It's a democratic country. You need to allow people to do it. If somebody's yeah. risk capital is very, very high, allow them. They can by all means go ahead and board that merchant. But at least people are aware that whether they need to board the merchant or not to board the merchant. So that's where I would stand there. Understood. Thanks, thanks, Sevan. Uh, let me, uh, Akash, let me uh, ask you a more sort of a tricky point, uh, nothing to do with the payment aggregate, aggregator regulations. How do you see, uh, uh, like, more, uh, in fact, all of you are funded by investors, uh, uh, whether, whether it is strategic or economic investors. Uh, whenever an investor comes to kind of uh, look for additional funding uh, in, in, in the company like yours, 
what do they generally prefer? Should you be regulated entity or you be the entity where what you are and doing what you are? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a tricky one, right? Uh, and I keep going back to to this quote, which I heard, uh, you know, somewhere. I'm not really sure where. Uh, it's like, you know, if uh, if you're doing something which is not regulated, it's really bad for you. But if it's something that is regulated, then it's like way, way worse for you. So <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, two sides of a, of a knife, essentially. So I think, see, regulation helps uh, helps in a way that you know that you know, this is an industry where there is, you know, some kind of thought that the government is giving, which is, of course, good. Good in the sense the government is encouraging. Uh, it understands that uh, there is uh, this entire digital momentum, or, you know, let's say payments is a space which is very essential for the country. So I think in that phase, it's good, right? When you see the revision is coming in, and some of the things which Devan mentioned, like uh, like this common match list and all, it definitely helps. It helps every company, which is a very good thing. But there is always a very fine line between being well-regulated and being overly re- regulated. And that line also sometimes is very easy to miss. So as an investor, the moment you start seeing that, you know, it's going over the line, if you know, if, which of course then leads to stifling of innovation, it leads to maybe you know, uh, chan- like you know, caps you know which come which can be put on your growth. Like for example, there is this thirty uh, percent market share cap which came in on you know UPI right uh, recently. So when investors see things like those, maybe they'll feel that yeah, you know, the upside is limited. Again, the reason why anyone would invest in any space is because of the upside, right? How big can something grow? And if there are if you know if there are factors which are mitigating that, then it's it's not a good thing. So regulation by itself is not bad. Regulation is very much welcome. It helps. It helps you separate you know the black from the white, or you know gives some kind of you know legality to it. But yeah, there is always a fine line that you would that you draw there. Thanks, thanks, uh, Tusha. Your take on this? You want to come in and share your perspective? Yeah, I I would agree with Akash what he has said. Yes, regulation has both its positives and negatives. Uh, negative yes because there is stifling of uh, uh, innovation and there is a limited upside but see uh, what i also feel is that for any investor it is uh, what is more important what is important is how difficult it is for somebody else to get it so if there is an entry barrier which is getting created the value automatically starts going up so uh, it, like uh, like uh, akash said so it's it's basically balancing both on one hand, you are a scarce commodity now in the market because there are regulations and there are anti barriers which are happening. But at the same time, how good is your innovation? How lean are you? How how quick are you? Is what will decide uh, on on whether the whether you have been able to get enough interest from the investor uh, to invest in your company. Sure, thanks. Uh, we have only two minutes left uh, to close this session, uh, and I wanted to come to each one of you, uh, maybe quick 30 seconds. Uh, 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 Ravi, to start, uh, uh, what one change would you recommend to the regulator? I'm sure RBI uh, would be hearing this session as well. Uh, 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 any one change that you want to recommend uh, uh, as part of the current set of guidelines? I think uh, one would be uh, basically the startup thing. Uh, one is like uh, currently we have a network criteria of around 15 crores. I think for the startup uh, things, if we have to encourage in a payment space, we can start with the net worth of around 5 crores. And later on, depending on the turnovers or the volumes of uh, that particular entity, this uh, net worth criteria can be increased over a period of time. Just like we started with the uh, prepaid, the PPI things also. That's why one of the criteria, one of the suggestions which I want to get to are there. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Ravi. Devang? Uh, my take is on, again, on data storage. Again, uh, our regulator should permit storage of car data with the uh, payment players because all of them are PCI DSN certified. At the same time, uh, people are, again, you are a regulated entity. So there is lesser chance of a risk of data uh, going out or anything. You can put large, larger uh, penalties on if there is, there is any data leakage. And anyway, you're not storing CVV. So, or even including case of UPI, you don't have any issues because you're storing only the handle. The whole act is being done by the uh, customer only. So I think uh, yes, it's more predominantly to do data storage for improving the user experience. It's not about anything else, but definitely for improving the user experience, there's a lot more you can do with that and analytics that you can run on that. Tushar? 
Yeah. See, now, since we are a regulated entity with RBI, obviously, it will be a two-way process. And what I would want from RBI is that we should get a voice with RBI, which earlier we didn't have. We had to go through banks. So if there is any innovation which we need to come out in the market and maybe brainstorm with, with this set, select set of committees, this will give us a way of how to be able to have a two-way dialogue with RBI uh, on, on uh, anything that we need to do. And, uh, Yes, and on the uh, on the merchant side, what I would want RBI would request RBI is that the uh, the PCI uh, DSS compliances and all is largely going. To, it's not of any use for the merchant because he does not need the card data. He does not keep the card data, and along with tokenization and things like coming in, you, you really don't need that kind of infrastructure. Otherwise, all the mom and pop stores and and the startups in in the who are actually trying to digitize a lot of things would have a tough time. Sure, Akash. Yeah, I, th I think great points by all. Uh, if I have to add another point to it, uh, it would be that uh, there's this restriction or other another regulation about you can have only one escrow account. So I think that anyways, having all the escrow accounts are uh, very much regulated by the banks at the RPI, and if you restrict it to just one, it does uh, have a lot. It does you know increase your dependency on one particular bank. And it does create some kind of exigencies on how you manage your, you know, uh, payouts to your merchants and other things. So I think that restriction shouldn't come in. So yeah, I think that's I think, the only thing I have to add to this. Only for one clarification, Akash, I think there is currently two escrows yeah, 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 RBI. The recent yeah. clarification that has been coming just for your information. Yeah, 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 yeah thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. I, mean, I would say basically had, adding any limit over there may or may not be, uh, you know, productive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I sure. agree. <laughs> sure. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so uh, my quick uh, sort of a one thirty seconds on the on, as a take, take take away. Yeah, I think uh, the introduction of these guidelines is is a, is a step in the right direction from RBI. Uh, of course, there are a few uh, points conditions that merits uh, uh, sort of a revisiting. Uh, but I think uh, there's there's an interesting time for a lot of these payment aggregator acquire a business to kind of try and keep innovating on the on the products user experiences yet being compliant. Uh, from the RBI regulation standpoint. So I think that's my two bits. So thank you everyone uh, for sharing your insights uh, and perspective around these regulations. Uh, back, Karima, back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jain. Thank you to all our esteemed panelists for an amazing session. And thank you to the audience. Uh, we will soon be back with yet another exciting session in, our, in a very short while. And please do visit our virtual exhibition space to check out our partner booths and their offerings, especially Lyra's booth to participate in a very special uh, lucky draw and win some exciting prizes. So thank you so much to everyone. Have a great day.